Can you believe that we're three weeks into a new school year? Does that seem crazy to some of you already? The very first day of school, maybe you remember this or maybe you saw this this year if you're a parent, but it's phenomenal how courageous you students are. Because you come to school after being away for all summer, or some of you are coming to school for the very first time, and your parents bring you to the door, and then they say, I love you. And then they leave you there for six hours. That's a long time to be all on your own. And it's incredible because some of you are so courageous. You just march in there and you're like, all right, here we go. Here we go. I've been through this shtick before. Some of you, some of you, I saw this uh, the first day of school. Some of you maybe cried a bit, which is okay. Because then your parents went out and they cried a little bit. That's right. Or some of you grabbed onto your parents' legs and were just like, yeah, you're not going anywhere, mom. Like, we're in this together for six hours. Some of you just ran in. You were excited to see friends you hadn't seen maybe the whole summer. You're like, yes, this is going to be so great. I've got a new teacher. They have no idea what I'm like. You know, like, that's great. But for students who were, this was a brand new place or a brand new classroom, a brand new school, I watched this happen. Some of you got up and you walked across the room and he started talking to somebody new and building a friendship. We're doing a series right now called Just Walk Across the Room, and that's the whole premise that in order to share the gospel, in order to love people, in order to have relationships, it all starts with that walk across the room. I saw this really clearly uh, during recess, the first day of school. There was a boy up here picking blackberries, my blackberries, by the way, but anyway, I, did, I let him pick them anyway. But he's there picking these blackberries. And then some other boy runs up and says, you like blackberries? And then he starts eating blackberries with them. And that's it. They were friends. That's all it took. You like blackberries? Then they went home. Their shirts were all stained with blackberries, I'm sure. And that's it. They're best buds for life, I think. All over that common thing of blackberries. Last week we started, it was the first week of this short series we're doing all about evangelism. And whenever we talk about outreach or sharing or evangelism, people say, but pastor, how do we do it? It starts with a walk across the room. And this morning we're going to talk about three more components. What do you do when you walk across the room? You develop a friendship. You discover their stories and you discern the next steps. What happens now? What do we do next? Our last year's was really intellectual, I think. We really wrestled. We really dug into Scripture. We really kind of looked at some Greek and some other things. This is really practical. And so what I want to do right now, I'll explain it first, and then we'll do it. We're going to take three minutes right now, and I'm going to invite you to stand up and walk across the room. I don't mean stand up. Not yet. Hold on. I'll just talk about it a bit more. I appreciate the energy here. That's why they get to sit in the front, because they're energized. I want you to stand up. I don't want you to pivot and talk to your spouse, okay? That's not what I mean. I don't want you to talk to the person you talk to every single Sunday after church. If you're in the choir loft, come over here. If you're over here, come over here. Let's let's talk to somebody new. And this is what I want you to do. Have a conversation. That's it. Those are all the instructions. For three minutes, I'll time you, and I'll tell you when we're done, okay? Some of you are in a panic right now. And I can appreciate that. It's driving you to prayer, though, I hope. So this is good. This is faith building. Let's stand up right now, walk across the room, and have a conversation with somebody. Participating. I really appreciate your trust, but let's kind of debrief now of what that was like, what that experience was like. For how many of you was that uncomfortable to do? How many of you had some discomfort about You're actually uncomfortable at raising your hands now. A bunch of hands like, all right, that was, 
especially once we started talking, that it was super uncomfortable. Okay, how many of you um, talk to someone you haven't talked to before? Anybody? Isn't that pretty phenomenal that I think most of you here would say that this is home, this is your church home, and yet there's so many people in this room of 120 people, you'd say, oh yeah, I've actually never talked to that person before. Because when I come to church, I bring the people that I know, and I talk to them after church, and then we leave together. Or I talk to that one family, I talk to that one friend, oh, we have coffee together every Sunday, it's so great. I actually don't know their name either, but it's pretty comfortable to just have coffee with them. It's fascinating that so often that's true in churches, we just know one or two And this church, we really value community. It's one of our priorities. It's up on the wall. Healthy relationships. A healthy relationship with God, healthy relationships in our family, but healthy relationships as a community together. So that's an area that we can keep growing in. How many of you did some praying during that time of, yeah, Lord, please make these three minutes go fast, right? That was a prayer for some of you. How many of you, okay, so lots of you introduced, how many of you talked about work? How many of you talked about work? How many of you talked about weather? And you just hung out there the whole time. Gonna rain? <laughs> you like, like the rain? <laughs> how many of you, um, well, that's, I was gonna say, how many of you would like to talk to that person again, but you couldn't look across the room? And you find, hey, I raised my hand, but they didn't raise their hand. That'd be awkward. That'd be uncomfortable. We won't, don't do that. How many of you talked about family? Anyone talk about who you're with or family? Yeah, okay, lots of you. Just kind of normal things to talk about when you first meet somebody. I met a hockey dad yesterday at hockey. Sass so was there. I was the gatekeeper, which was awkward. I've never done that before. And there was another dad there. So I said, hey, I'm Ian. He said, I'm Noah. I said, you ever done this before? No. You know what we're doing? No. And I said, who are you watching? He was watching number 28. And he told me a bit about how his son had started playing hockey. So I was like, I'm watching 58. And, you know, he's going to be in the NHL any moment now. I think there's, I'm hoping there's a scout here and we can just wrap this business up. This morning, we're in part two of this series we're doing. Last week, we talked about Jesus being the single greatest gift that God has ever given, that Jesus came to us, and we had a manger up here and a cross up here to remind us that he came as a gift to live for us, and also part of that gift was that he would die for us as well. Why? Because he loves us so much. God loves us so much. And then we also talked about that he is a gift that everyone needs. Everyone needs to know Jesus. And he's a gift that is absolutely free. You don't buy your way into the kingdom. You don't earn your way in. He comes to people for free. So we kind of talked about that as our premise. And then we also ended with this idea that he's for you. He's for you. He's for you. He's for all the people out there. He's for all the people in your cul-de-sac. He's for all the people in your workspace. He's for you, everyone. And so this morning we're talking a bit more about how do we share him? Well, it starts with those three things that we said about developing a friendship, discovering stories, and discerning next steps. When you develop a relationship, it's pretty easy. You've done it before, but some of you need to develop new friendships. Some of you need new friends because your current friends are actually not good friends. Some of you have friendships. I know where your friends betray you. They lie to you. They steal from you. They take from you. They say they'll be there, but they are not there. So some of you need to develop new friendships, friendships that are safe and friends who are trustworthy and friends who are there for you and encourage you and support you. Some of you need new friendships because you're lonely. You've moved or you're new to this area or, or the friends that you have have scattered or maybe you've drifted apart and you need to develop new friendships. Some of you need to develop friendships. You have great friendships, but you need to develop them some more in the sense that you've never talked about faith before. You actually don't know what their faith story is. You need to develop those friendships some more. And some of you need to develop friendships with people who don't go here. You need a friend who isn't a Christian. I think you need that to have a sense of what is going on in the rest of the world. I think you need that also to be faithful to what Jesus has called us to be, lights in the world, Uh, out there. Here is great. I love how passionate many of you are, how much you serve here, but we also need to be connected out there in the rest of the world. If you go to any church, I think, in Canada, and you ask them, you walk in and say, hey, is this a friendly church? They say, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, we are friendly. We've got greeters at the door. They're like, great. So does Walmart. 
I've never walked into Walmart and been greeted and thought, I've got to start working here. Like, I, I should go for dinner with that guy, right? See how well he's dressed? He's wearing a vest. My dad works at Walmart. He's never said, Ian, you got to join the club. I've never looked at him and said, Dad, you look so sharp in your vest. <laughs> Can I spend Sunday mornings with you? No, that doesn't happen. If we want to grow, if we want to have new relationships, it's not just about being friendly. It's about being a friend. It's not just about being friendly. It's developing friendships. How do you do that? Well, we did that in kindergarten, and maybe you did that in university. Maybe you've done that at your job. But it's this process that has to keep on happening. I can tell you, church, I need to do this. I need to develop some friendships outside of you. I love you guys, but I sometimes don't leave the property for weeks. I'm not joking. Out the gate, I've been locking it. I'll stay in. No one can roam in and surprise me, be spooky to meet someone new, right? I mean, we need to, I need to develop friendships, reach out, spread out, and see what's going on in the rest of the world. Often when you develop a friendship, it happens like this. You have a common interest, right? I mean, hey, you're a teacher, I'm a teacher. Or you like bike riding, I like bike riding. You like knitting or sewing, I like. You like cruising, I like cruising. You like watching the Canucks lose, I like watching the Canucks lose, right? You have some common interest and then it just grows from there. What do you guys do? Oh, we watch the Canucks lose. That happens a few times a week, right? I mean, you have this thing that draws you together and then you can expand from there and find out, oh yeah, we, we do this or we do that or uh, you can grow from there. You have some common starting point. I want to look at Acts 16 with you. We'll put it up on the screen. We're kind of jumping into the story in Acts 16. So what's happened is that Paul is this missionary, this incredible missionary, and he's gone out and he's going to all these communities and building churches, and we'll look at a pattern he has in that. But he's just decided to go somewhere, and God's told him no. God has kept him from going there. And then during the night, he has this vision where he sees this man from Macedonia saying, come to us. And so he's on his way to Macedonia, but he has a stop, and that's where we're kind of hopping into the story here. It says this, from Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Samothrace, and the next day we went on to Neapolis. From there, we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony and the leading city of that district of Macedonia, and we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house, and she persuaded us. Paul's this fascinating, amazing missionary, and as he would go to a new city, he would have this pattern. He'd wait for the Sabbath day, church day, and then he'd go to the church, to the synagogue, and he would start to reason with the Jewish men there, the Jewish leaders there, and say, listen, you're Jewish, and I was Jewish, but now I've trusted in Jesus. He's the one we've been waiting for. He's the promised one. But that plan breaks down when he gets here to this city of Philippi because there's no synagogue. There's no church. And what's interesting about that is I've been reading about it. And to have a synagogue, all you needed was 10 Jewish men. But it seems like there's not 10 Jewish men in this city. Some people have said it's because it was a Roman colony and they wouldn't let them build a synagogue. But when that would happen, often they would build a synagogue outside of the city or in the closest place. So it seems like the Jewish population here is very small. And so instead of going to the synagogue, which doesn't exist, he just starts walking around looking for a place where people might gather to pray. When he gets there, he starts to build relationships, starts to talk. And then the next D, first is develop relationships. The next one is uh, discover stories. He starts talking with this group of women who are here. And if we go back a slide, uh, we'll see one more slide. He learns a lot in one conversation, it seems like, right? Just like when you started talking with someone, you maybe introduced yourself, you maybe talked about work, talked about family. Well, he has that same kind of conversation. It says that he meets this woman named Lydia. That's her name. Uh, finds out where she's from, the city of Thyatira. Uh, finds out what she does for work. She's a dealer in purple cloth and finds out also this point of commonality that she worships God, that she's Jewish. 
And so finally, as he, we don't know the next parts of the story, but obviously this conversation grows significantly as he listens and shares and starts dealing and growing in this relationship with her. It's just a normal conversation though, isn't it? Hey, what's your name? My name's Lydia. Where are you from? I'm from this city. What do you do? Oh, I work with purple cloths. Go to church? Yeah, I worship God, but there's no church, right? Just kind of a normal conversation. You've had these conversations before. Simple, simple. I mean, think about how you've met someone. Started with a name. When I met this guy at hockey yesterday, started with a name. I'm Ian. I'm Noah. And we talked about what we had in common. I don't know what I'm doing. Neither do I. Why are you here? I've got a son on the ice. So do I. I mean, he doesn't know it, but we're just about best friends now. I should have got his phone number, but I'll see him at hockey again, right? Because we're going to be there again. You develop a relationship, a friendship. You discover the stories, and then the next part is to discern next steps. What's next? As you discover stories, you might find out they've had a really bad history with church, or you might find out that they're really interested in church, or you might find out that they're some other religion. You might find out that they've never heard about Jesus before. You might find out that they have a family member who goes to church, but they have never been, or who knows what you might find out. But as you discover their story, you'll think as you're praying about it, oh, I think this would be the next step. I think the next step would be uh, getting this, maybe the next step is um, curious about uh, all the history of it or the reliability of it. Or maybe the next step is, um, you know, getting them a Michael W. Smith album because they're from the 80s and they'd love that, right? Or maybe the next step is inviting them to something at church. We have tons of things happening at church this fall. And the reason is because I'm a really great party planner. It's like planning things. That's not the reason I'm terrible at it. I'll tell Cindy, Cindy, I've planned something. And she must just be thinking, oh boy. Because when I say I've planned it, it means I've booked it. But then there's a million details that I'm handing over to her. Like when are they coming? Who's going to host them? What, what, what are we? All sorts, all the details. But we plan all these things like block parties or our trunk or treat that's coming up or the ventriloquist that's coming up or the Fraser Valley Wind Ensemble that's coming up right before Christmas or Nerf night where we're going to let kids run rampant with Nerf guns. All of these different things are opportunities for people to say, hey, why don't you come to this? They're friendly there. No, you don't want to say that. You say, I've got lots of friends there, right? Come meet some of my friends. Come to Nerf Night. Come to this. Come to that. That's the whole point of all these different activities. So you can discern the next step. God, what should I do next? He'll tell you if you ask him, I think. What should we do next? As you discern next steps, uh, you'll find out what you should do next. I want to watch just a short video clip about this. I'm a little concerned right now about your salvation and stuff. How come you have not been baptized? Because I never got around to it, okay? I don't know why you always have to be judging me. Because I only believe in science. But tonight, we are going up against Satan's caveman. And I just thought it would be a good idea if you... <laughs> Felicidades. <laughs> I don't recommend that strategy for next steps. All right? <laughs> The surprise baptism isn't a great idea, but as you go, maybe you'll find out the next steps. I love how he starts out. I'm a little concerned about your salvation. <laughs> it's a pretty good line, really. <laughs> don't wear the spandex and don't get the bowl of water, but it's a pretty good line, I think. As you talk with them, you'll discern next steps. This is what we should do next. It's interesting in this quick conversation that Paul has that she wants to get baptized, right? And maybe there was more conversations in between, but it tells us that he's only there for a few days. So in the span of three days, he develops a friendship. He hears her story. He discovers her story. And then he discerns, this is what we need to do next. We need to get this lady and her whole household, it says, baptized. And it's a pretty phenomenal conversation, but it's really just ordinary stuff, right? But with the intention of walking across the room, and introducing someone to God's greatest gift, Jesus. That's the whole process. How do I do evangelism? You have a conversation with someone. 
You d- develop a friendship. You discover their stories. Hear where they're at, where they're coming from, and then you discern what the next steps are. I want to read just that part again from Acts 16. It says this, one of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. Just regular, ordinary life stuff that has a transformation that lasts for eternity. I mean, that's so powerful. It doesn't just happen here. It happens again and again and again with that same structure in the Bible. Let me ask you this. Who opened Lydia's heart? Did you catch the great conversation? Who? It's not that he... Li- God does. It's not that Paul had such a great conversation with her. It's not that he laid out the facts so perfectly. It's not that he'd taken the just walk across the room course and nailed each step in the process. It's just that God was at work there. He was praying for her. This week when I was at Bible study, someone shared, and I think this is so great. He said, maybe the reason I don't love this person more is I'm not praying for them more. The more you invest in someone's life and you're praying for them and you're finding out, what can I pray for you next? I think the more you just get to know them and care for them and love them. And as you're praying for them, God is at work in them and he promised to do that. We did a survey here this summer uh, that many of you completed. And and one of the questions was, who's someone? We want to partner with you. We trust the Holy Spirit's at work. Who's someone you're praying will come to faith this year? I think 99% of you put in a name. About 75% of you put in two names. Some of you put more names. And one person just said, more, for the third option. More names. I've got more people I'm praying for. Which is so great to think as a church, we're praying for these people. You're praying for them. We're praying for them. I'm praying for them. But you know who wants them in heaven more than any of us do? It's Jesus. It's Jesus who took the ultimate walk across the room, not just from here to there, not just from Galilee to Jerusalem, but from heaven, Jesus crossed space and time. Jesus crosses history and steps into it, is born for us because he loves us so much, comes to us because he loves us so much, comes for you because he loves you so much. And he knows your story. He knows that your story is one of brokenness, a broken relationship between you and God. He knows that story and he knows the next steps. Each step towards Jerusalem was part of that re-knitting together. As he goes to the cross, as he dies for you, as he rises again, that's all for you as he knows what needs to happen next. You need forgiveness. And so Jesus comes and wins that for you. You need life. And so Jesus comes and gives that for you. You need hope. Jesus comes and wins that for you. And now, church, he sends us out to share that with the world. Last week, I had this big name tag that said, uh, for you. It's for you, and it's for you to carry now out, to go and share that with the world around you. Church, would you join me in that? Would you join me in that this week? That person that comes to mind is you think, oh yeah, I would so love to see them here. I'd so love to see them come to faith. I'd so love to see them go back to their church, whatever church that is. This week, would you, maybe just phoning one, would you discern what the next step is with that person? Maybe just phoning them up and saying, I've been praying for you. Or maybe it's phoning them up and saying, I would love it if you'd join me here on Sunday morning. Or maybe it's phoning them up and saying, I've got this book, this bookmark, this card I want to send to you, whatever that is, would you join me this week and take that next step in introducing them to Jesus, the one and only Savior of the world, the single greatest gift of God. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you that as we gather this morning that we've been able to laugh, we've been able to sing, we've been able to share a little bit about... um, what it's like to talk with someone new. God, as we gather together this morning, we're reminded as we look at Acts about the intentionality that Paul had in sharing the gospel. It points us back even more so to the intentionality that you had, Jesus, in coming for us to develop a relationship that you knew the next step that needed to happen, so you took it. God, we thank you that you love us so much, not because of our accomplishments, not because of what we have in the bank, not because of how we look, but simply because you made us and you love us dearly and desperately. 
so much so that you are willing to come and live and die and rise. It's eternal. God, that's great news. That's incredible, life-changing news, eternity-transforming news. So God, I pray that you'd put it on our hearts and minds. And this group is praying for people. God, I pray if they don't have someone in their life right now, I pray that you'd bring a, a, a name to mind right now of someone that they can reach out to. And God, we commit the, the end result to you. We commit the whole process to you. We know, just like Paul didn't convince Lydia, that we can't convince anyone to trust in you. But we pray that you'd go before us and that you'd be opening up hearts and minds and lives right now and that those people would be ready when we call, ready when we reach out, that, that it would already be top of mind for them. God, we want to see your kingdom grow. We want to see it grow here. We want to see it grow in our school. We want to see it grow at West Winds down the street or Crossroads down the street or Sunrise down the street. We want to see your kingdom grow today. God, I pray that you'd be with each person here. For those who are struggling in friendships, for those who need new friends, I pray you'd give them courage and boldness. I pray that they'd be received well. For those who need to be introduced to someone outside of Christianity, I pray that you would make that happen this week, that it would just be so obvious and apparent that you've put that person in their path. For those who are lonely, I pray that you would surround them with people who would care about them and love their hearts and minds with the world around them. Lord, for everything else on our hearts and minds, for the world around us as we see so many uh, disasters going on, as we see governments raging against each other, as we see wars and all sorts of other things, God, we pray for your peace. We pray that you would bring peace to our world. We know that can only happen through Jesus. We pray for those who are hungry today and will go without food, even while we have such an abundance. We ask that you provide for them. Lord, you've gifted us with so much. I pray that you'd help us to be generous with that. For everything else in our hearts and minds, we commit all these things to you, trusting in Jesus who taught us to pray.